Coming up next, the story behind a song with a dual meaning that makes the Puritans blush and even the most uptight fuddy-duddies truly fall on the floor laughing their heads off. It was written by a rock icon who was always the life of the party, to his detriment. In a drunken haze, he turned his fascination with one of his body parts into a song meant really as filler for the album, but it became a surprising classic rock standard. One that everybody who's come of age really since the 70s has laughed about with their friends for days on end. We're going to loosen up the shackles of uh, appropriateness here and have some fun telling the story of this ballsy track coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever tried to defeat Mike Tyson on Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, came up short a lot like I did, you're going to dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Also, check us out on Patreon. There you'll find an additional catalog of exclusive content. You can also become an honorary producer to help us curate this music history. I got to start this out and I have to say that ACDC isn't just one of the greatest rock bands ever. They're also one of the funniest. They're just hilarious. I mean, you got to have a great sense of humor and loads of audacity to record a song like Big Balls. Leave it to the master of the double entendre, Bon Scott, to compose such a cheeky classic of innuendo. After all, the young brothers, Angus and the late Malcolm, told us it was Bon who unleashed ACDC's swagger when he became the band's lead vocalist and signature lyricist back in 1974. In the liner notes for Bonfire, ACDC's 1997 album, Malcolm stated, and I quote, Bon was the biggest single influence on the band. When he came in, it pulled all of us together. He had that real stick it to him attitude. We all had it in us, but it took Bond to bring it out. Now, in Big Balls, Bond transformed himself into a snooty, high society host who's God's gift to ballroom notoriety. I mean, that line itself was a roar since Bond and the band were always broke during the 70s. Bond, you know, brags about how he always fills his ballroom with an event that is never small. Now the social pages say he's got the biggest balls of all. The social pages say I've got the biggest balls of all. With a sarcastic, posh accent, Bond pushes the envelope further and further with this, making us laugh even harder as the song goes along. It's a classic. Some balls are held for charity and some for fancy dress. But when they're held for pleasure, they're the balls that I like best. But when they're held for pleasure, they're the balls that I like best. We all know what the song is really about. We're all in on the joke. We all have a story of sharing this song with our friends when we were younger. I mean, everybody does. I'll share mine coming up. I hope you'll share yours in the comments. ACDC isn't the only musical act to inject sexual innuendo into a song. It's been there in all genres of music, especially in the world of rock and roll. I mean, three off the top of my head, you know, Willie Dixon's philandering blues classic Backdoor Man, recorded by Howlin' Wolf in 1960. A backdoor man. And then there's Melanie's Brand New Key from 1972. That was a number one single on the Billboard Hot 100, along with Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, and uh, ACDC's Homeland of Australia, a huge hit. I got a brand new pair of roller skates. You got a brand new key. And of course, there's a little red Corvette. Prince's international top 10 hit from his 1999 album, released in 83. I mean, I remember back in the day when I thought Little Red Corvette was about a Little Red Corvette. <laughs> Chuck Berry greatly influenced Bon Scott's lyrical style. His songs often featured highly suggestive lyrics, but he presented them in a humorous way, making them seem you know, less offensive. I mean, a prime example is My Dingling. Chuck didn't write the song, of course. It was composed by band leader Dave Bartholomew. But Chuck's interpretation of the tune was legendary. Ding -a -ling -a -ling, oh my ding -a -ling. Everybody sing. My Dingling shot the number one in Canada, America, and perhaps most shockingly, 
in the notoriously conservative United Kingdom. Remember our discussion about go all the way by the raspberries being banned from airplane in the UK back, uh, that was a couple months ago. That song wasn't nearly as obvious as my dealing. Chuck Berry, of course, one of the most influential artists of the rock era, uh, he referred to my dingling as a fourth grade ditty, his fourth grade ditty. Uh, his longtime followers found it childish double entendres, annoyingly juvenile, and really beneath his groundbreaking talent. He took a lot of flack for that one. Chuck didn't care. The dual king of rock once said, and I quote, it made a lot of money, a $200,000 check. I'll never forget that check. Catch me playing with my ding ling ling oh my ding. Now, Bon Scott paid tribute to another suggestive classic on this one, Great Balls of Fire, written by Otis Blackwell and Jack Hammer, that was, of course, made famous by the killer, Jerry Lee Lewis. In the second verse of Big Balls, he delivered the line, Everybody says I've got great balls of fire. Everybody says I've got great balls of fire. Now, according to Mojo Magazine, uh, Bon Scott penned the lyrics when he was drunk. Bon talked about writing when he was sloshed in an interview. Once he said, when I listen to the song the next morning, I think, did I really say that? Did I think that? But you can usually get some pretty good stuff out of it. I play it for my mom. And if she said, that's not very nice, I would always keep it. When radio DJs discovered Big Balls, they just couldn't resist putting it on the air. I mean, despite the risque lyrics, the song was too funny to ignore. They knew the audience, especially their male listeners, would absolutely love it. Since its release as a B-side to Baby Please Don't Go in Australia in 1975, Big Balls has been a rock radio staple. Baby, don't go. Baby, don't However, with all due respect to Bon Scott, the band is not particularly proud of the track. According to setlist.com, ACDC has only played Big Balls one time in concert. One time. Uh, they played it in London on November 10th, 1976, the only time they played it. When asked about the song by the media, Angus Young is careful not to bash the song, but he was honest about it being kind of an anomaly for ACDC. He said, and I quote, that was very different for us. I uh, wasn't sure if we were trying to parody love songs at the time because Bon wrote the lyrics for Big Balls. He went on to say, I don't even remember what the words are, to be honest with you. I do remember the song because the guy from our record label told us that's what was popular on the local radio then. Very soft music. He thought we should release it, you know, figuring it would probably get some airplay. I remember thinking, uh, who in their right mind would want this to go out? Angus elaborated, we were very fortunate though, because all the radio stations that had seen us live knew that that was not who we were. So these stations started to flip the record over and play the other song, which was a cover of a blue standard called Baby Please Don't Go. We actually scored a hit from the B-side, and that was the one saving grace of that song. Artistic merit aside, Big Balls, it's still loads of fun, right? There's no catchy Malcolm rhythm track or a face-melting Angus solo on it, but it wasn't really intended to be a signature song making a statement for the image of ACDC, right? All the band members, they were jokers that were just having a good time, especially while recording in the studio. Of course, Bond's antics often kept them in stitches. I do what I do without you. I love it. Malcolm Young, the co-founder that many called the brains of ACDC, he highlighted Bond's talents for double entendre. Big Balls is one song that sticks in the mind. It was just a bit of a joke, a bit of fun. We needed to fill up the album and someone came up with a rumba or a tango and Bond started writing these hilarious words to it. Uh, end of quote. According to Malcolm, Bond loved an innuendo. Of course he did. And he was obsessed with that particular part of his anatomy. My balls are always bouncing to the left and to the right. It's Big Balls is a cut on ACDC's revered album Dirty Deeds Done Dirt Cheap, a record that showcased the cleverness of Bon Scott and the Young Brothers for that matter, who collaborated on all nine tracks on this album. Uh, although it was first released in Australia in 1976, 
It didn't come out in the UK or the US until 1981. And that was a year after Bond's death in 1980. A lot of people forget this. The release of Dirty Deeds, uh, it was the epitome of bad timing as ACDC had just reinvented themselves after Bond's passing, you know, with the landmark album Back in Black and the unveiling of their new singer, Brian Johnson. To follow the massive success of Back in Black, the band was working on a new album, which would eventually become, for those about to rock, We Salute You. That was released uh, later that same year, 1981, it's Dirty Deeds. The US release of Dirty Deeds was seen as a momentum killer for their new album, actually, as Dirty Deeds outsold for those about to rock by quite a bit at that time. This forced the band to add songs from Dirty Deeds to their set list on the subsequent tour, shifting the focus away from that new material. It was kind of a bit of a mess. In the book, The Youngs, The Brothers Who Build ACDC, Jesse Fink quotes Phil Carson calling the release of Dirty Deeds one of the most crass decisions ever made by a record company executive. Carson points the finger at a r man Doug Morris and his New York City team. Should come as no surprise that Doug's reasoning at the time was purely financial. I mean, with Back and Black already selling over 5 million copies, you know, Doug figured that Dirty Deeds would sell at least 2 million. Carson concurred, but he argued that releasing it then would set a new sales benchmark for ACDC. He wondered how many albums for those about to rock could have sold if Doug had waited even six more months to release Dirty Deeds. We'll never know. Interestingly though, ACDC's cover of Baby Please Don't Go didn't get an international release until 1984. It appeared on the EP 74 Jailbreak, which included tracks that had only been released uh, in the band's native Australia. Even the most proper straight-laced person in the world can't help but snicker when you listen to Big Balls by ACDC. I mean, I laugh at the way Bon Scott narrates it as much as I laugh at his lyrics. Especially the way he slurs God's gift to ballroom notoriety. I mean, it's just hilarious. God's gift to ballroom notoriety. Bon Scott wrote another song about balls. Um, it was a song, She's Got Balls. This is actually kind of funny. It was not a double meaning for Mel Private Parts, though. Instead, it was supposed to be a compliment to uh, his wife's fearless nature. Certainly wasn't a love song. In the first verse, Bond wrote, got what I need, my baby. She's got the ability, hey, to make a man out of me. And that's about as touching as the tune gets. <laughs> the chorus of the song goes like this. The lady's got balls, she's got balls. She's got balls. She's got balls. Now, legend has it that Bon Scott's wife was so unimpressed by his idea of a song uh, that expressed his love and admiration in the form of She's Got Balls that she divorced him because of it. Imagine dedicating a song like that to your wife or your significant other. It wouldn't go very well in my situation, I can tell you that. Now, in Paul Stenning's book, ACDC Two Sides to Every Glory, the complete biography, the story behind the song She's Got Balls is revealed. Bon Scott joined the band in September of 1974, and at one point his wife complained that he'd never written a song about her. According to Angus Young, uh, Bon responded by writing, She's Got Balls. And she was so angry, so upset by the song's lack of romantic endearment, she promptly left him. Though this tongue-in-cheek response was really typical of Bond and probably true, his biographer Clinton Walker offers a slightly different perspective in his book Highway to Hell, The Life and Death of ACDC legend Bond Scott. Uh, Bond married Irene Thornton in January of 72, and they traveled to the UK with his then-band fraternity, spending a horrendous 18 months there before eventually returning to Adelaide, Australia separately. Their marriage had been strained by that experience, and shortly after arriving back home, Bond was involved in that gnarly road accident, you know, riding off drunk on his motorbike, as you may recall, talked about it before. Uh, Bond spent three days in a coma before making a miraculous recovery. Although Irene stood by him during this dark time, his behavior had effectively ended their marriage by the time he auditioned for the Young Brothers to be in ACDC. Now, despite the divorce, Bond and Irene remained friends. So there's two different versions of the story. Probably truth to each of them. Balls, 
I'm sure many of us had our bouts with our parents who thought we were going straight to hell for listening to such a dirty song. <laughs> We've all had that experience. I remember when my mom overheard me listening to the song. She barged into my bedroom like I was committing a crime. She told me, you better throw that record in the trash now. I had a ready-made excuse. I sheepishly told her that the song was about ballroom dancing. She didn't buy it. And of course, she called my dad to come up to get upset with me. I saw him over my mom's shoulder with a big grin on his face. He was a huge ACDC fan. And he kind of tried to say, you shouldn't be listening to this song. You know, kind of give me a look and I knew the whole time <laughs> that he loved the song. And I always fill my ballroom. The event is never small. I mean, I remember singing it with my friends and laughing hysterically over and over again. I mean, everybody's been through this experience. Then a few months ago, I overheard my own 13-year-old son and his three friends spouting off the lyrics together and belly laughing. It's kind of a rite of passage for prepubescent boys, right? Actually, Wolfgang Van Halen shared a really funny story about his famous dad introducing him to the song Big Balls. I guess during a family vacation, the Van Halen family was on a week-long trip to the Grand Canyon. Um, Eddie ran into Winnebago for the journey. And at one stop, while his mom, Valerie Bertinelli, went to the bathroom, Eddie said, Wolf, come over here, check this out. He then played big balls on the car stereo. And uh, a young Wolfgang could not stop laughing. We've got big balls. We've got big balls. Look. Big Balls is not going to be inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame. I mean, that's for sure. But it defined the rebellious spirit of rock and roll. Uh, it was a middle finger to media censorship, even though it still managed to generate airplay for nearly 50 years. That's awesome. That's how ACDC is. For those who turn up their noses at Big Balls, regarding it as too juvenile and not worthy of ACDC, or those, you know, that find the song offensive, I'd like to say this. I think the world is way too uptight these days, and we need to loosen up a bit with a little comic relief. Big Balls is juvenile. It's locker room humor and maybe a little offensive especially in mixed company, right? But it's not meant to be uplifting or intellectually stimulating at all. As Angus said about many of the lighthearted songs by ACDC of the Bon Scott era, there's not much seriousness in it. It's just rock and roll. Chew it up and spit it out. That's one I can get behind. Leave us a comment about this classic song. What are your memories of it? I mean, seriously, Everybody had this experience growing up with their friends, laughing, singing the lyrics, you know, share some of your experiences below. I try to be a serious channel. Every now and again, it's fun to talk about a song that we've all had an experience with. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe below, click the red button. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.